Larry, uh, it's great to be here with you. And I wanted to say to everyone who is here, you have made a great choice of how to spend your time. I have been asking Larry questions since I was 19 years old, a student, and he has never failed to offer brilliant answers, whether it was how to reform the economy of the Lithuanian Soviet Socialist Republic, how to save the world economy in 1998 or 2008, or, and this is a sign of what a great friend and human being Larry is, what to do when my mother was dying of cancer. Uh, so we are all in for a really wonderful session. Uh, I'm a journalist, so I pulled a few people beforehand and I said, okay, what should I ask Larry? Top of the agenda, Larry, was people wanted to know, given your experience in the Treasury with Bill Clinton, in the White House with Barack Obama, what is your view of the U.S. economy right now, and what advice, as someone who has been an insider but is a little bit on the outside, and the president is reelected, so you can speak your mind, what should he do? Um, look, I think people have counted the United States out uh, before. They, John Kennedy died believing that the Soviet Union surpassed the United States by 1985. <laughs> Every issue of the Harvard Business Review in 1991 had a version of the joke that the Cold War was over and Japan had won. And I think people make that mistake now with respect to our economy and uh, with respect to our politics. I think if we seize the moment, we have huge and unique uh, opportunities uh, in the world. This is a moment for broad renewal that corrects all the deficits that we have. Yes, we must put our finances on a sustainable uh, basis over the next uh, several years. But the budget deficit is not our only uh, budget deficit. Everybody in this room has been through Kennedy Airport. No one, I suspect, is proud to think of it as the gateway to the greatest city uh, in the greatest country uh, in the world. If a moment when the federal government can borrow money at negative 75 basis points in real terms for 10 years and construction unemployment is well into double digits is not the moment to do something about it, I don't know when that moment uh, will be. This is the moment to renew our health care system. And we're on the way with respect to uh, assuring access, but we're not everywhere we need to be in terms of containing uh, health care and uh, costs. This is the moment when we have a profound uh, deficit with respect to the way in which we are providing opportunity uh, to children in the lower half of the population who are falling further behind in terms of education and who are even falling further behind in terms of what's most fundamental, uh, death rates and how long uh, they live. And this is the moment when we can correct uh, that uh, deficit. So if we can, in our public life, in our corporate life, and in our individual life, we can each turn our attentions more to the future and away from the press of uh, the present, this can be a profoundly important moment for the United States and for its role in the world. Larry, I want to follow up on your starting comment about the deficit. You are an alumna, alumnus of Bob Rubin, um, but it sounds as if maybe you think we shouldn't be emphasizing the deficit all that much. Are, are you moving into the Krugman camp on this one? I, I don't. I don't know that I, I'm. I don't know that I'm going to do uh, camps. But look, <laughs> too in, bad. <laughs> look in 1993. Here's what the situation was. Capital costs were really high. The trade deficit was really big. And 
the, uh, and if you looked at a graph of average wages and the productivity of American workers, the average productivity in the economy, those two graphs lay on top of each other. And so bringing down the deficit, reducing capital costs, spurring investment, raising productivity growth was the right and natural central strategy for spurring growth. That was what Bob Rubin advised Bill Clinton. That was the advice Bill Clinton followed, and they were right. Today, the long-term interest rate is negligible. The constraint on investment is lack of demand. Productivity has vastly outstripped wage growth. And the syllogism that reduce deficits spur investment and you'll get more middle-class wages doesn't work nearly the same way. Now, that doesn't mean that the deficit is inconsequential. It is central to prudent defense. If you don't get the deficit under control, at some point, we're going to have a macroeconomic catastrophe. But whereas in 1993, a focus on the deficit constituted a compelling growth strategy, when you start with today's interest rates, when you start with today's gaps between productivity growth and wages, deficit reduction is necessary hygiene to protect against economic disaster. It does not constitute the basis for a satisfactory growth strategy. And that's why the emphasis on spurring the right kinds of investment you know, when people talk about infrastructure, yes, that does mean Kennedy Airport. Yes, that does mean no potholes. But it also means why do I get the same test uh, four times in the course of six months? Because doctors, because medical records take place on paper folders uh, and the average doctor's office has less technology than the average 7-Eleven. That's a task of private uh, infrastructure. So is uh, broadband. So is much else. So that's why growth strategy today, when the interest rate is already so low, when you're in a knowledge economy, can't just be about removing the obstacle of uh, government debt. Okay, if there are reporters in the room or watching, my advice as an editor is that's a very good snap headline right there. Um, following on from your focus on growth, uh, there is an argument which I hear more and more people taking seriously, I think advanced maybe most boldly by Tyler Cohen, that maybe growth, maybe innovation, maybe this productivity growth you were talking about is over. As he puts it, the low-hanging fruit has been picked, and we're kind of in this stagnant period. Do you buy that? Not a bit of it. <laughs> um, everybody in this room was required to turn off their device a few minutes ago. The device you were required to turn off, here are three things about it. It had more computing power than the entire Apollo project. It gave you better access to information than being able to walk freely around the Library of Congress. There's more, all the information is there and it's a lot better cataloged on your device. And in terms of reaching people all over the planet, you would trade John Kennedy's White House communication system even up for your iPhone. And that was an inconceivable thing 20 years ago. And five billion people on Earth are gonna have it five years from now. So I don't see how anybody can say we are not making fundamental and profound progress. And one other thing, the prophets of doom can't have it both ways. You cannot simultaneously say that software's eating the economy, 3D printing's taking away manufacturing jobs, the Google car's taking away driving jobs, there's self-checkout in every retail establishment so there aren't gonna be any jobs for regular people anymore. And say nothing's happening that's important for productivity growth. 
You just can't say both of those things. And as between those two, if you want to have a dystopian idea and think about a problem, I think the much more fundamental idea is what technology is doing to uh, the middle skilled and what that's going to mean for the inequality. And the risk is that you're going to have designers and devices who are going to combine to produce fantastic wealth for uh, designers with less uh, for everybody else. And how are we going to manage that as a society? That's a problem. And that's a very serious problem. And I think that's probably the best single way to think about uh, the inequality uh, challenge. But I think that's a much more serious uh, problem than the idea that somehow there's nothing new that is augmenting uh, anybody's uh, capacity here. And, and one other thing, I, I see my friend uh, Francis Collins uh, sitting here, and he knows infinitely more about this than uh, I do. But probably the wisest aphorism I learned in graduate school was my teacher, the late Rudy Dornbush, who used to come to Davos, saying to me that things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then they happen faster than you thought they could. He mostly meant that with respect to unsustainable financial policies and fixed exchange rates and stuff like that, which obviously has some resonances for the moment. But I think it is also very powerful with respect to technologies. You know, it was famously observed in 1987 that the computers were everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And, you know, then you saw what happened. And I suspect that with respect to the life sciences, the set of things that come from genomics, the set of capacities for augmenting human capacity, I think are just going to be staggering. Ponder this. Uh, through the 20th century, for a century, human life expectancy went up three months every year. And there is no evidence that that trend is slowing. And some reason to think that it might accelerate. And the best view, as I understand it, although this is debatable, is uh, that probably healthy life is going up at least as rapidly as uh, total life. So I think we've got huge potential uh, for uh, betterment. And just as I think uh, my uh, grandchildren, um, just I think as you know, my grandparents envy the kinds of lives, if they were alive, would envy the kind of lives we get to lead. I have very little doubt that we will envy the kinds of lives uh, that uh, our children and our grandchildren uh, get to uh, lead. And look, one other thing that suggests this progress is going to uh, continue, it is a slightly freaky but actually compelling finding of social science known as the Flynn effect that human populations almost everywhere get smarter every year, that uh, average IQs go up two or three points a decade. And if you kind of don't believe that, just turn on the leading TV show of my childhood, The Beverly Hillbillies, <laughs> and then turn on a leading TV show of a few years ago, like West Wing, and ask yourself what intellectual demands they place on the watcher. And you will see that. So I, I think the progress in understanding, in comprehension, in so many things is staggering. And by the way, I think that's an important part of why, as my Harvard colleague Steve Pinker has demonstrated, there's, with fluctuations, a trend towards much less violence uh, in uh, the world. And that's very much at the heart of what the president talked about in his uh, uh, inaugural address when he spoke of Selma and Stonewall, the widening circle of inclusion, uh, tolerance, and uh, opportunity. So we could make huge mistakes. We could blow it. There could be uh, reversals. But fundamentally, I think uh, 
long-term progress uh, by free and freer societies is about as secure a bet as there is. Okay, you're a cheerleader, and when I go home, I'm going to tell my kids Larry Summers says they are smarter than I am, which mm. they will be very happy to hear. Um, I'm sure Tyler Cohen is watching this, so consider the gauntlet dropped. Tyler, I want to get your blog response. Um, you touched, Larry, on another issue that I know you think is very important, which is this issue of inequality and the shape of the economy. Um, my sort of journalistic hyperbole about kind of the dystopian possibility is maybe we're going to be divided into a society of a few geniuses who invent Google and iPhones and everybody else who gives them massages. Um, how much are you worried about the economic forces pushing us in those directions, the gap that we're seeing opening up between productivity gains and wages, and what should we do about it? I think it's the right, I think it's the right thing uh, to, uh, w to worry about. And I think there are troubling trends uh, in, uh, the in the direction uh, that, you, uh, that you suggest, uh, Christia, and I think you're absolutely right that the system will equilibrate, as economists like to explain, the system will equilibrate at full employment but maybe the way it will equilibrate is that full employment is there'll be uh, specialists in cleaning the shallow end and the deep end of rich people's swimming pools. And that's a problematic uh, way for us. That's a problematic way for a society to function. I think we got to think very hard about making sure that uh, there's competition in the activities where the leaders are leading so that that competition, that success manifests itself in lower prices and not just in higher profits. And so making sure there's competitive markets is, very, is and the reduction and elimination of barriers to entry is, I think, uh, something that is uh, very, very important. I think we do have to look at uh, fairness in uh, the way our tax systems uh, function. Some of that is about uh, tax rates. Some of that is about technical tax provisions, which are boring to listen to me talk about, but are hugely uh, important, that don't even rise to the level of being tax expenditures on the tax expenditure table, but mean that the largest part of the accumulation of wealth and the passage of wealth from generation to generation passes almost with no uh, taxation. And whether it's devices for avoiding the escape, uh, state taxation or whether it's the basic fact that the creation of fortunes takes place in the form of capital gains, which largely escape taxation and uh, death, there is a serious tax reform uh, agenda that has the potential to be very important that's about provisions that nobody much thinks about. Uh, the carried interest provision that people have talked a lot about is the tip of a very large iceberg of stuff like it that lies under the surface that ultimately I think is an agenda that can make uh, an important difference in terms of equality. I think the other part of this, though, is uh, education and uh, the development of both the intellectual and the characterological um, traits that are necessary to have a uh, distinctive uh, niche uh, in the world that is important if people are going to be able to maximize uh, their uh, opportunities. The most important advice I always gave young people uh, during my time as president of Harvard was figure out something you care about and can be good at. Don't make yourself fungible. If you're doing something that 50 other people are doing because it's more comfortable for you to be part of a pack, 
the rewards to that are going to steadily diminish because you are going to be fungible. Figure out something where you've got some distinctive niche and we're going to have to figure out in our educational systems how to help more and more people uh, discover uh, those kinds of uh, attributes. You touched, Larry, just now in that answer on capital gains, on treatment, tax treatment of carried interest. That's part of this bigger issue of financial services, how it's function, how they are functioning in the economy. As you know, there's a very lively debate. Has re-regulation gone too far? Has it not gone far enough? There's been a loosening of Basel III. Where do you come out on all of that? Look, uh, in the 30 years of my, uh, 25 years of my adult life, involved uh, studying and then being near this th being near this stuff we had the 1987 stock market crash we had the brady plan to resolve the latin american debt crisis we had the snl crisis we had the mexican financial crisis we had the asian financial crisis we had russia and ltcm we had the internet we had the internet bubble we had enron and the problems in the high yield market and then we had the big crisis <laughs> and that works out to once every three years, a financial system whose function is supposed to be to distribute and manage risk ended up being a source of risk that hugely damaged the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And so the, there is an imperative to have this be under better uh, control than it historically has been, and certainly the errors historically have been of insufficient attention to risk and to its cascading consequences in both the private and the public sector. And so we've got to make very sure as we implement these rules and as we consider uh, what comes next uh, that uh, we err on the side of containing uh, risks rather than on uh, the side of allowing them to go unchecked. It is an enormously complex thing to do effectively, and there is a risk uh, that if you don't know what you're doing, you can uh, be counterproductive uh, with the actions uh, that, uh, you, uh, that you take. But uh, we, this requires enormous and disinterested attention. And I have to say, as one who's not especially given to populist instinct, um, <laughs> the four and a half lobbyists at a cost of about a million dollars per, per member of the House and Senate who worked Dodd-Frank for a year, four and a half members per member of the House and Senate, does give one some pause about how that process uh, was, uh, was working. Now, you know, the great danger is that you go with that to the idea that an idea must be good if a bank doesn't like it. And that's also not uh, a valid uh, idea. But I, I think we need an enormous amount, uh, more than we have had to date, of fundamental thinking about how to keep the structure of this system stable. And the clearest evidence of that is something which is only addressed to a small degree in everything that's happened which is if you look at Bayer, Lehman, Wamu, Wachovia, Fannie, and Freddie, AIG, every one of them was judged by their regulator a, roughly an hour and a half before they failed, <laughs> a month before, they, not an hour and a half, that was, that was said for effect, a month or two before they failed to be very well capitalized according to the concepts of capitalization with which we were operating. 
And that suggests that merely increasing capital standards in the way we have thought about capital may not entirely nail uh, this, uh, this problem. And uh, look, it is precisely because I have so much admiration uh, for Jamie Dimon and some of his colleagues at J.P. Morgan that the saga of the whale is, it seems to me, so troubling because they really did have strong, they had every incentive to not have that happen, really every incentive to not have that happen. And if they couldn't make it not happen, you got to sort of wonder whether a group of civil servants watching intermittently um, are how and in what ways they're going to be able to contain risks. So I, I think this needs a lot more uh, reflection than it's received. I am sure that the combination of the fears engendered by what has happened and the steps that have been taken have operated in the direction of uh, reducing uh, risk, but this will take a lot. Uh, this, this, this is not a challenge for a day or a week or a year. This is a continuing challenge that needs to be managed. Any hints on where, which direction, in which direction the answer lies? Is it improving the type of capital? Is it breaking up these institutions? Is it around liquidity? Uh, liquidity is part of it. Reliance on markets and automaticity um, is, uh, a, a, is another part of it. Reducing uh, uh, interdependence in any situation, where, anytime you have a situation where it's good to be first to the exit, you have the potential for, uh, sub uh, for uh, substantial uh, instability. In general, I'd be looking not as an alternative to regulation, but as a supplement to a little more looking at signals that are coming from the market as a sign of when there's uh, potential uh, for uh, uh, potential uh, for serious problems. Okay, our time is almost running out. I'm going to try to squeeze in two more questions, so let's do them at a speed rate. Mm -hmm. Economists often feel jealous of natural scientists like physicists because they can do actual experiments in a laboratory, but the global economy is a laboratory of sorts, and we're seeing some very different approaches in countries like Japan, Britain, the U.S., to some <coughs> similar challenges. What is macroeconomics learning from this? Look, I think three years from now, people are going to be able to look at what's happened in Japan and look at what's happened in Britain and learn something. If uh, Japan has worked its way into hyperinflation and Britain is thriving, it's going to be impossible for Paul Krugman and other Keynesians to keep talking the way they have talked. <laughs> Conversely, if Britain is stagnant, and Japan has turned around after 20 years of stagnation. Those who dismiss the idea of stimulus and uh, believe that austerity is the answer are going to have a much more difficult time leaning their views. I try to apply a discipline uh, to myself, which I guess I think journalists should apply to everybody on the everybody who thinks and writes in this stuff. What could you see? in the next several years that would lead you to think you'd been importantly wrong mm -hmm. and would cause you to think you should change your mind. Mm -hmm. And I think that people should think about where they are on what's happening in Britain and Japan. Mm -hmm. And that's got the potential to be a powerful, uh, not perfect in a variety of things that aren't controlled for and the like, but I think that's got the potential to be a powerful test. Okay, we have you on the record. Where are you placing your bets? I'm going to... Go some, um, I'm going to go uh, somewhere in between. I, I think uh, uh, austerity is not austerity is not the route to pos posterity to prosperity in any country where the interest rate is uh, near zero. Uh, not ever. Um, 
the right kinds of expansion, uh, expansionary policies carried out with some prudence, I think can be very availing. That's my reading of the Recovery Act in the United States. And it's not yet clear whether, just where Japan is going to go. But I think they have the prospect, if they manage this right, of from a very low baseline producing some significant improvement in performance. Okay, and I'm going to take you up on your challenge. Where, with hindsight, do you see the biggest intellectual mistake you've made, and how has that changed your thinking? Well, I wasn't quite, uh, you know, uh, it's, like the, it's like the old interview question, you know, what's your biggest flaw? I don't, I'm really too, you know, I'm really too conscientious, gosh. Uh, so, you know, I could do one about where I failed, uh, to, uh, where, where I failed uh, to, uh, persuade, uh, to, uh, to persuade people. Uh, you know, that's a classic one. I don't think, um, I'll go back some, uh, some, uh, some distance. I think in retrospect, and it was a consequential thing, as uh, we addressed uh, Indonesia in uh, the 1990s, I think we insufficiently understood that what we interpreted with some legitimacy as um, supporting resistance to corruption was, as it was implemented on the ground, a threat to an ethnic minority, the Chinese population, that had a very large amount of money uh, in a small minority and probably generated more capital flight and instability than it did confidence by some significant margin. And I choose that example because uh, a distinction Bob Rubin always drew, and it's one that I think is very important, is anybody who makes a lot of choices makes lots of choices that ex post they wish they had made differently. You know, if you, if you play poker and you choose not to draw to an inside straight, you know, every so often you made a mistake by not drawing your inside. You wish you had drawn to the inside straight, but you did the right thing. That's a case, and I think this is always the right test to apply, not do you wish ex post you'd done something different because that'll always happen if you make decisions in an uncertain world, but could you have made a better decision with the basis of the information available? And I think there's a reasonable argument that we in the, the IMF uh, could have made uh, that decision uh, in, a, uh, in a better way. Okay, last question. We've run over time, but I hope you'll forgive me for taking just a couple more minutes. And just turning to a personal side of things, I have watched you now in a number of different incarnations. And what I have been struck by is consistently you have remained incredibly intellectually engaged and intellectually curious, both about the challenges of your particular job and just also about what's the new, new thing, what's the frontiers of thinking. You've never kind of stopped. How do you keep on doing that? I don't know. I guess it's sort of. Uh, I'm not sure that. I'm not sure that it's true. I'd like. To, uh, I'd like. Uh, I'd like to think it is. Um, I guess I think um, complacency is uh, the enemy of uh, improvement, and you just. I just don't think there's anything that doesn't get improved on. Uh, by thinking about it hard and uh, challenging uh, its uh, premises. And I guess it's always been uh, my sense uh, before I knew the phrase that uh, what's most important in the world is probably the idea of, probably the authority of ideas rather than uh, the idea of authority. And uh, it seems to me that fostering that wherever one is, is uh, and never believing that because I said so, um, or because someone said so, 
constitutes a good reason for doing something is uh, the way is is the way in which uh, you uh, you make uh, the most uh, the most progress. I think ultimately it's uh, from I uh, it's from ideas uh, that uh, the world moves forward. And as I tried to explain before, I think the world has moved forward immensely, and I think it probably will move forward uh, immensely uh, in the future. Okay, well, thank you. That's a rousing concluding note. Plus, we have to be optimistic about human progress and America. We are going to hold you to the Britain versus Japan bet. We'll come back to that. And if you see Larry around later on, my unasked question you can ask him personally is his personal health and fitness secret because he is looking sleeker than I have ever seen. So thank you very much. I've got to do this for I've got to do this for a friend. Uh, Dr. Mark Hyman is sitting uh, in this room somewhere, and uh, there he we'll is, be right at, there, we'll, second row. We'll be at uh, we'll be at Davos. Uh, my wife uh, dragged me more or less kicking and screaming to see him. Um, I did what he told me, and. Uh, there has been uh, progress in there being less of me uh, <laughs> since uh, since that uh, took uh, since that took place. I had a stock joke that I used in all kinds of settings. You know, how much should we improve American education? People would say, or how much should we reduce the budget deficit? And I'd always say, you know, look, that's like asking how much weight I should lose. I don't know exactly, but there's very little danger that I'll lose too much. Um, that's still true, but it's less true than it was at the various times when I made the joke. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.